In 1900, Robert Frost and his family moved from the Massachusetts industrial town of Lawrence to a farm near Derry, New Hampshire. For $1,800, William Prescott Frost, Robert's paternal grandfather, purchased the 30-acre place with its orchard, fields, woodland, and spring. The catch came later in William Frost's will. Robert would own the farm if he worked it for 10 years. In 1952, he wrote a friend, I must say the core of all my writing was probably the five free years I had there on the farm down the road from Derry Village toward Lawrence. The only thing we had plenty of was time and seclusion. I couldn't have figured in advance. I hadn't that kind of foresight, but it turned out right as a doctor's prescription. A time of peace and artistic growth, the Derry years also saw their share of pain and strife. Already frail, Eleanor was pregnant five times in six years. After the death of her son, Elliot, she withdrew into the first of many despondent silences. When Robert Frost sailed with his wife and family for England in 1912, he was returning to his English literary roots, to the land of Shakespeare, Wordsworth, and Browning. Frost had at least two other reasons for moving to England. Eleanor's romantic wish to live under thatch, and his own need, as he said, to live cheap and write poetry. And I got over there in England to, with the idea of writing a novel or a play to put the family on its feet, and one night I sat on the floor and looked my poems over and made up a little book and took it into a strange publisher and in three days signed a contract. Escorted on its voyage by two British destroyers, the SS St. Paul avoided German submarines and sailed safely into New York Harbor in February of 1915. As Robert Frost walked with his family from the steamship toward Grand Central Station, he paused at a newsstand and glanced at the cover of an ambitious new magazine, The New Republic. To Frost's delight, the contents listed a review of North of Boston, his second book. The reviewer was the prominent poet Amy Lowell, who praised the book, hailing it as the most American volume of poetry for some time. Robert Frost's first day in New York produced more literary surprises. After putting his family on a train to New Hampshire, the poet decided to visit the offices of his new American publisher, Henry Holt. At Holt and Company, Frost met Alfred Harcourt, head of the trade department, who handed the cash-strapped Frost a sizable check. It was $40 from the New Republic, where Harcourt had placed the death of the hired man. In 1924, Frost's fourth volume of poems, New Hampshire, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. The collected poems won the Pulitzer in 1931 and was a Book of the Month Club selection, which brought Frost higher royalties and a wider audience. But success, had its costs. And in the 1930s, in response to the Frost cult, Frost, the purveyor of good cheer, uh, academic critics began to speak harshly uh, in their reviews uh, against Frost <clears throat> as somehow having betrayed uh, the, tr the true heritage of modern poetry, which should be difficult and complex and ambiguous and not easily available and not spoken in the voice of a, of a bard who gave out consoling wisdom. Frost's middle years were shadowed not only by trouble with the critics, but by personal tragedies. In 1934, the Frosts suffered bitterly through their daughter Marjorie's slow, unnecessary death after childbirth. In 1940, Frost's only surviving son, Carol, took his life. And Irma, the poet's youngest, was committed to a psychiatric hospital in 1947. The hardest blow fell in 1938, when, after 43 years of marriage, Eleanor Frost died of heart failure. Robert was shaken, seemingly broken. She dominated my art with the power of her character, he said of her. 
He was restless, irritable, and despaired of working again. A few months after Eleanor's death, Theodore Morrison, a Harvard professor and director of the Breadloaf Writers' Conference, invited Frost to Breadloaf. There, Morrison's wife, Kay, became Frost's secretary, handling his mail and arranging his busy schedule. The two formed a deep, if ambiguous, attachment. Whether the relationship was platonic, as she maintained, or romantic, as Frost said, Kay Morrison revived the poet, who began writing some of the most memorable verse of his career. For Frost, love and poetry were inseparable. Kay Morrison provided the support and affection the poet needed for the next 24 years of his life. Thank you.